Now, your expectations will determine your experience. Um, you know, if I, and I've seen this a lot in my own life, where if I go to watch a movie and it's by one of my favorite directors, it's got a bunch of actors that I like, an interesting premise, and I go in expecting it to be a masterpiece, and then it's just good, uh, I leave very disappointed. In the same way, if I go into a movie expecting it to be absolutely terrible, because um, it doesn't have anyone that I know and it looks bad, but then it's actually pretty good, I'll leave ecstatic. Like, wow, what a great time that was. Now, that, that's true um, how our, our expectations um, kind of dictate our experience, not just with movies or with entertainment, but really with a lot of life. Um, our expectations will shape what we experience. Um, and as we begin our study of First Peeper, I want to help us to have kind of the right expectations, partially just for this book. A lot of this book is not going to taste great. It might not be the most enjoyable thing. Some of it is going to sting. A lot of it is going to really challenge us. And part of what First Peter is trying to do is to recalibrate our expectations. And so this morning, we're really going to talk about um, our expectations in life. You know, what can we as Christians expect to experience? As we follow Jesus in our lives, what can we expect? Should we have high expectations? Should they be low because we need to have the right kind of expectations. If we have the wrong expectations of the Christian life, you're going to be vastly disappointed, and many people are. I often see um, too many Christians have the wrong expectations. They expect to follow Jesus and for it to be something that is just always amazing. Um, it's always filled with great blessings. And, you know, they follow Jesus and everything in their life is going to work out the way that they want. He'll always show up. And then when Jesus doesn't quite meet their expectations, their faith can crumble and everything falls apart, when their prayers for healing and restoration aren't answered. And Peter here is trying to help us. And our text this morning, I'm in 1 Peter 1 through 12, is really going to kind of show us the expectations that we need to have as followers of Jesus. So if you have your Bible, if you turn with me to 1 Peter 1, we're going to go all the way to verse 12, and if you would stand as you are able for the reading of God's Word, starting in verse 1 of 1 Peter. Peter an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is unperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are by God's power being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, that you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your salvation or outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when He predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. And in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things in which angels long to look. The grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would be here this morning, um, that you would calibrate our hearts and our ears and our minds, that we would encounter you in your words. That you would challenge us, that you encourage us, that you would strengthen us, that you would draw us to you, that we would leave this place changed. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, you can be seated. If you're taking notes in your bulletin, our, our first point for you is that we need to expect to be exiles. We need to expect to be exiles. Now, an exile, again, somebody who's been cast off or they're removed from their true home. You think of somebody who's a wanderer, or a refugee, or a sojourner, or an immigrant to another place. 
And Peter wants us to understand that as followers of Jesus, this is who we are. We are exiles. In verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, if you read too fast, you might miss what's happening here. This isn't just like a cute little introduction, and then we'll get to the real meat of the letter. He's not just letting us know who the letter is going to. He writes and he calls them elect exiles. And he's not just describing their spiritual condition, he's actually also describing their physical and their sociological reality. So all of these regions that are mentioned here, these are all located kind of in modern day Turkey. Um, and this letter, at this point in history, in these regions, um, is really kind of like the Wild West. These were all very new colonies. And the way Rome colonized places, I mean, you really didn't usually want to be a part of those new colonies. They would pick people, you didn't really volunteer, and then say, congratulations, you are now going to Cappadocia, and you're going to colonize it for us. And so he's writing to Jewish and Gentile believers who have been exiled from their home and cast out and sent into these regions. Now, we don't know what their exile looked like. They likely were forcibly sent by the government to colonize it. They could have just ended up there because they were fleeing persecution. This seems to be what happened to Peter. After all, Peter right now isn't in Jerusalem where he's been most of his life. He's writing this from Rome. He's now in Rome far from his house in exile. And this is where he will die. And there are those who may have believed, who received this letter, they may have thought that Rome was their home. They may have thought that this empire and this nation and people was theirs. They may have hoped to be welcomed and celebrated, that the glory of Rome was their glory. They got to be a part of the greatest nation in the world. They got to be somewhere that had the best art, the richest place in the world, where all the significant things happened. That was their home and their place and their people. But Peter's trying to remind them, no, no, you are exiles here. This is their spiritual condition as well, that this world and this place is not their home. The empire isn't their home. They are just passing through. And their true home and our true home is in the kingdom of God. Now, this trap is the same one that we can fall into, too. We can have the same exact temptation. We can start to believe that, wow, we're not really exiles and sojourners here. Um, we're citizens. This is my home. And we can start to believe that maybe our country and our place here is the kingdom of God. And that's dangerous. That's very spiritually dangerous because it can cause us to forget our fundamental identity as Christians. We are exiles in this land. As Mike was reminding us this morning, we do not and we cannot have the same relationship to our country and to our place and our communities that other people do. We can't if we're really followers of Jesus. Now, we can love this country. We can be happy to be here. We can root for our country in the Olympics. I've been doing a lot of that in my house. There's been a lot of USA chants, especially for my children. Um, but don't spoil anything that's happened this morning because I'm going to go watch it when I get home. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad. But we do have to remember as we do that and as we participate that we are exiles here. Our true home is not here in this place. And if we expect to be exiles... If we expect to be treated like exiles, and if we expect to act like exiles, then we can have our proper relationship with this land and this place. Because, listen, even if um, massive revival swept through our nation that put the first and second great awakenings to shame, and every single person who was here was truly saved. 100%. And every elected official is now born again, and we pass all these laws that are just based on the Scriptures, and everyone is actually living out their faith and bearing the fruit of the Spirit. This country still would not be the kingdom of God. Even then, this country would still not be our true home. And even then, we would still be exiles. We're exiles here. This is not our home. And we can't expect it to be, and we shouldn't act like it, and we shouldn't be shocked. Wow, I, I thought this was the kingdom of God. Well, it's not. Why are you surprised that it doesn't look like it? If you forget that we are part of another kingdom, your mood and your life here is going to be, start to be tied to every election and every new story and every new law and every whatever, instead of being tied to Jesus. 
and instead of being tied to the kingdom of heaven. But notice what else Peter says. He doesn't just say exiles. He says to the elect exiles. There's a lot of meaning in this word. A part of what he's saying is you're not exiles on accident. That God chose and he elected us to make us exiles. It's not that we have been rejected by the world, though that's true. It is that we have been accepted and chosen by God. Verse 2 tells us a little bit about this, what this election looks like. He says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The foreknowledge means that our election, our choosing, it's based on God. That we were chosen by God to be His sons and daughters based on Him, not based on us. And this is something that happened um, before we were born. Now, some, maybe some of you, might want to argue about the specifics of this. Well, how does that work? How does that square with our free will? Um, I've got opinions on that, but the point is, and what Peter is trying to remind us here, is that this happens because of God's grace. We have not been elected because of how amazing and incredible that we are. We've not been elected because God looked and saw, oh, I know their potential. They're just going to be a first-round draft pick. Got to have them in my family. He said God saw all of our weaknesses. He saw all of our sin. He saw all of our mistakes, all the things we're embarrassed about. And God said, yes, them. I want them as my son. I want them as my daughter. And He loved us anyway. It also says that we are sanctified to obedience by the Holy Spirit. Part of what it means to be an elect exile is that the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. By sanctifying us, it means He is making us more and more like Jesus. He is helping us grow in our obedience through the power of the Holy Spirit. That we are following in the footsteps of Jesus. That we are obeying God's laws more this year, hopefully, than we did last year. That God continually sanctifies and makes us more and more holy. And that we are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. Part of what it means to be an exile is that you are marked by Jesus' blood. When he died and when he shed his blood on the cross for our sins, it marked us. That much like in the book of Exodus when they covered their doorposts with blood to mark who belonged here, Jesus has marked us with his blood. We've been forgiven for all of our sins. Now, we need to expect to be exiles here, but we also need to understand the incredible blessing of being an elect exile, that we've been chosen by God, that you've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. If you've put your faith in Jesus, you've been justified by the blood of Jesus. Now, being an exile might not always be fun, but what an incredible gift that God has given us. That's our first expectation. We got three more. Our second one is we need to expect to be saved. Expect to be saved. Now, this point isn't necessarily about confidence or assurance of salvation. Part of what Peter's trying to do in these next couple of verses is he's really trying to expand our expectations of salvation. Because most of the time when we talk about salvation, we always, or mostly always, talk about it as something that's happened in the past, something back there. We might ask somebody, hey, when were you saved? When did you become a Christian? And we talk about salvation as if it's like a singular moment. We say, oh, I can remember exactly where I was, here's what, and that was it. But the Bible speaks about salvation as not just being a one-time thing that happens in the past. It talks about it in much grander terms. The Bible often talks about salvation as being something that is past, something that is present, and something that is future. Verse 3, he says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, for He has caused us to be born again. So we're going to look at each of these tenses. First, we see the past one. Peter reminds us of the past tense of salvation. This is something that God does to us. It is that moment where we are born again when we put our faith in the crucified and risen Jesus Christ and we get to come to new life. And so there is a very deep sense, and and I don't want to give you the wrong idea, but salvation is something in the past. And the past tense of salvation should encourage us. So one pastor I like, I've probably quoted this before, his name is Evan Welcher, but he often says, you know, Christian, you need to remember your baptism. And really what he's doing there is not as much about the moment of baptism as it is about remembering that you have been saved. That your salvation is a past event. Remember what baptism means. is a climactic moment of that where you come together and the church gathers around you and we all, you profess your faith in Jesus and the church affirms and declares, yes, this is somebody who knows Jesus, who has died and is born again. And so we should look backwards 
to the past tense of our salvation, to be encouraged and reminded, oh yeah, my salvation's been decided, I can take heart. But our salvation also has a present tense. He says, and He has caused us to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Our hope is a living hope. Our hope is alive. It means that our hope is a present tense reality. Our hope is not that something in the past happened and it used to matter. Our hope isn't that something used to be really significant. Ah, now it's not anymore. We kind of got to change and adapt to the times. Our hope is a living reality. The hope of a believer. The reason that we have been saved is because Jesus Christ is alive. Not he was alive. Not he was risen. He is risen. He is, at this moment, still alive today. He is not among the dead in the ground. And so our hope is a living hope. And our hope is a living hope because Jesus is alive. He really is the living hope. And our expectation of that salvation is that it has a present reality as well. Because I have been saved in the past and because I am currently alive because of Jesus and the power of resurrection should be flowing in our souls and in our bodies. This is part of what was mentioned before in verse 2 about how we are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. This should be a present reality that we are continuing to live like those who have been saved and who have been born again and who are currently now in the moment being made more like Jesus. Salvation should be a present reality. We see this too later in verse 5 where he says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you are a Christian, God is actively guarding you now. At this moment, your salvation is currently happening as God continues to guard and continues to save you. There also is the future tense. The salvation. Verse 4, you're saved to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Again, salvation is not just something that happened to us back when we became Christians. It doesn't just refer to the reality that now we are Christians. It also refers to something that will be done because we are Christians. We are waiting for it to be revealed. So this is why, in a sense, you could also say, you will be saved, or I hope to be saved. It's not that, oh, I don't really know if I was yet in the past. It's that I know my salvation is still coming in the future. And there are many verses in the Bible that talk about salvation this way. Romans 5.9, Hebrews 9.28, 1 John 3.2, and many more. And because that future tense of salvation refers really to the moments of our death, because all of us in this room will die unless Jesus returns. But at that moment, if you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus, is when you will be saved. That is the moment where instead of being taken down to hell in judgment, you will get to go into heaven and be with Jesus forever. It describes the future salvation as an inheritance, that there is an inheritance that is waiting for you. But it's not an inheritance that's going to come to you when your parents die. It's not an inheritance that will come to you when some long distant family member you didn't really know that well die and left you a bunch of things. This inheritance will come to us when we die. Then we get the inheritance. And it's a inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. It is a very good inheritance. It's not a kind of inheritance that leaves you scratching your head and wondering, what am I going to do with all this junk? I don't want this. I, I wish I didn't get left this inheritance. It's not an inheritance either that can be squandered or lost. It's not an inheritance like if you had really rich parents, but then they lost all their money through bad investments gambling or vice or bad advice and now someone else is going to take it and you thought you'd get a good inheritance but it perished. This also means that our inheritance can't go away because of our own failure. Your inheritance is not based on your obedience. Your salvation isn't dependent on your works either. It's based on Jesus and what he did. Okay, let's say you had an aunt who, who was rich and older and you, wanted to, you might want to make sure, I'm going to behave a certain way around her so that I don't, you know, get written out of this will. 
Okay, maybe I'll go over to her house a little more often, give her presents, and I just want to make sure that she's happy. You certainly wouldn't want to, you know, go to her house and steal from her or cut her out of your life and scream and yell at her and tell her how much you hate her because you'd recognize, well, this inheritance might be mine. I don't want to behave a certain way. But the inheritance that comes from Jesus, the inheritance that comes from His substitutionary death on the cross for us, that we may be declared and made righteous and that the riches of heaven can be taken and given to us, that inheritance is unfading. And your sin is not going to make you miss out on that inheritance. Jesus will not write you out of his will if you sleep in one Sunday because you just don't want to go to church. He won't write you out of his will just because you fail again. As long as we've put our faith in him. And there's a sense for the Jewish believers this would have been particularly meaningful because the way that they viewed and the way that the Old Testament often talked about the promised land was that the promised land was their inheritance, but that was a perishable inheritance. It was an inheritance that they lost because of their disobedience. They were kicked out of the land and welcomed no more. And Peter wants them to know, hey, the land isn't our true inheritance. There's a better one. And that inheritance is undefiled, and that inheritance is unperishing, and the true inheritance that comes in the kingdom of God is unbelievable. And I don't know if we really recognize um, and fully understand how amazing it is and really even what it means to be saved. I don't think any of us fully get it, and we won't yet give you an example. If, if it's not clear already, I really love going to the movies. It's one of my favorite things. Um, here's where it might be a little different or weird. I really like previews at the movie theater. Okay, I want to go early because I don't want to miss any. And I want to get a good seat and I want to watch every single one. If they would show 30 straight minutes of previews before the movie, I would be in heaven. That's great. You can come to our house sometimes. Rhea will tell you. She'll okay, I'll just watch previews just for fun. I'm not even going to watch a movie. I just want to watch a bunch of previews. And so especially when I'm at the movie theater and I haven't seen a lot of these previews yet, um, I can just get so sucked in just to the magic of cinema and the beauty of the silver screen of what's coming um, that I just love it. And every time, you know, when it's done, okay, now the actual movie's about to start, I'll lean over um, to Brie before it starts and say, hey, uh, what are we watching again? I forgot. Um, <laughs> And it's just a running joke, but, you know, there are sometimes it really is true. Because I just enjoy what's happening so much, I forget what really I came in the first place, what I paid to see. Okay, here's the reality. Um, all of us who are followers of Jesus, who have yet to experience the beauty and the wonder of what it means to be born again and, and all that Jesus means and the beauty of salvation in this life, that you've experienced in days or months or years or decades, that is just a preview. The movie hasn't started yet. You're not going to believe how wonderful it is once we get there. It's so important for us to have the right expectation about salvation. Um, Salvation isn't just something that happened in the past. It's not just something happening now. It's also something that's going to happen in the future. And we need to expect it to be even better than what we've seen so far. Point number three is you need to expect to suffer. Expect to suffer. Usually want to do good news, bad news, but this is how Peter wrote it. Take it up with him, not me. Um, He tells us suffering is normal. Experiencing trials, experiencing hardship is the normal Christian experience. If you find yourself being really tested... You find yourself under a lot of spiritual attack. You find yourself facing a lot of suffering. That's normal. It's normal. You haven't done anything wrong. Um, You're experiencing what all Christians should be experiencing and should expect to experience. But we don't expect to suffer. We never expect it to be us that the thing happens to. That happens to other people. And often Christians don't expect to experience hardship or trials. They just want to experience blessings and beauty and things get better and better all the time. And then when they suffer, they see the church suffer, they see the local church experience trials, or they see their community suffering, they start to think, what is God doing? How could He allow this? This is so strange. But Peter tells us here, and he's going to tell us over and over and over and over again through this book, um, you will suffer. This is one of the big themes of the book. And so 
We're going to talk about suffering a lot, but the main thing that we need to understand is we need to expect it to come. Now, none of us like pain or suffering. You know, anybody who signs up for it. But it is a little easier to take the pain when you know it's going to come. I mean, it won't feel better. It's not going to feel great all of a sudden, but you can know, okay. It's less of a sting when I know it's not a surprise. I should have expected this to come. So this is Jesus kind of telling us, hey, I'm so glad that you're following me, but I want to remind you, um, it is going to hurt. Verse 6, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. You notice Peter doesn't even specify what these kind of trials or suffering is, just various ones. Could be trials of persecution, like the ones he and the church is facing there. It could be trials of having health problems and suffering. It could be the trials of poverty and trying to escape. It could be the trials of demonic opposition to gospel work. Um, Peter doesn't specify what it means because on some level it really means all of them. All trials that we find and all the suffering that we face is to be expected. And we really shouldn't be surprised no matter what trial we find ourselves in. Because these are normal. In verse 7, a part of why does this happen? God gives us a little hint. It says, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The reason um, Peter calls them trials is because they test us. And so it is in enduring these trials proves that our faith is genuine. You think about during Jesus' ministry, there were lots of crowds that followed Jesus. There were thousands of people that followed Jesus during his ministry because they wanted to see him heal. They wanted to hear him teach and listen to his sermons. And then when his teaching started to get difficult and challenging, the crowds left. And on the day that Jesus was crucified, there were only a few women and John left. Everyone else had abandoned him. So how we respond... And how we act when the fire of trials and suffering comes um, reveals whether our faith is genuine or not. Part of why we suffer is to separate the wheat from the chaff, to reveal who the true followers are. But there's also part of this that Peter says that sanctifies us. As painful and as unfun as it is, few things will help you grow in your faith like suffering. Few things will bring you closer to Jesus than going through trials. Because it burns a lot of the other stuff away, and you realize how little any of that helps. He tells us our faith is more precious and valuable than gold, but it is going to go through the fire. But part of our encouragement in this is to know that our God endures the flames, and He endures the fire with us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fire. They said, oh, wait, it seems like there's a fourth one who looks like the Son of God walking with them. He goes with us. We will experience trials and suffering. It doesn't mean that God has abandoned us. It doesn't mean your faith is weak. It doesn't mean that you failed. God is still with you. So what does it mean for us? I mean, we just need to expect that these trials come. We cannot act surprised when Christians suffer. We need to face them um, as tests of our faith. We need to face them as things that we know that will sharpen us and help us follow Jesus. So listen, you can't follow Jesus without carrying your cross. And you can't carry a cross without expecting to die on it. Okay, we say, okay, we're supposed to carry our cross. And then we're shocked when it hurts. And that the God that we follow who suffered and was killed and who then tells us, hey, take up your cross because you're also going to suffer and be killed and do this. And we're like, whoa, I didn't know there was suffering involved. No, I expect it. Don't be surprised when it comes. We're going to talk about this a lot more as we go through the book. Um, but our last point, point number four, is we need to expect Jesus. Expect Jesus. Um, the greatest thing that we should expect in our lives is Christ. We should expect our lives to be filled with Jesus. We should expect our lives to be centered around Jesus. We should expect Jesus to be close to us. We should expect Jesus to never leave us, never to forsake us. And ultimately, all of our expectations should be centered on Christ. Look at verse 8. He says, um, though you have not seen him, you love him. 
Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. This verse is beautiful. Peter is just blown away by their love for Jesus. He's encouraged by their belief in Jesus. He's floored by their joy. But when we read this, we need to remember who's saying this. We can kind of forget the context sometimes. This is Peter, the chief apostle, somebody who knew Jesus better than most. Okay, he probably knew Jesus and maybe even loved Jesus more than some of the other apostles. Certainly more than some of the other disciples who were there who had been following Jesus. Peter knows what Jesus' laugh sounds like. Peter knows what Jesus smelled like. Peter knows all the little things about Jesus that you can only really know about somebody when you know them really well. You've been around them for a long time. And then how does Peter respond when he hears that other people love Jesus too? Okay, he doesn't mock others. He doesn't say, well, you know, you guys don't really know Jesus like I know Jesus. But I really know Jesus. Instead, he's just filled with joy. He's so excited that you love Jesus too. And he's amazed, wow, you guys believe and you have faith even though you didn't see him. The man who walked on water, the man who has cast out demons and healed the sick is amazed at our faith, that though we don't see Him, we believe Him, and we love Him. You can only really do this too, we can only really love and feel this way about Jesus if we, if we expect Him, and we can only really love and believe in Jesus if we expect to see Him one day, and if we expect our faith to be fulfilled. Verse 9 tells us, you, you love Him seen and hoping to obtain the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls, and the hope and the outcome of our faith is being with Jesus. Being saved from our sins and our death, it's that future tense of salvation again. We also, too, I, a lot of what Peter does here is he wants us to recognize the blessing that it is to live on this side of Christ's coming. The last, you know, four or five years, I don't know, I've not been like the most fun time to be alive. I'd like to live in some boring times instead of these unprecedented historical ones. Um, but what we need to realize is the incredible blessing that we have that we are born now. Because all of the prophets, Isaiah, Moses, Elijah, and Jonah, they would trade places with you. Hey, you go be a prophet. You live back then. I want to live when you do. Verse 10, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. The salvation that we have experienced if we are followers of Jesus, the simple message of the gospel that maybe you have heard since you were a child, they searched for. They inquired carefully about it. They kept asking God again and again, hey, what does this prophecy mean? Who's the Messiah going to be? When's he going to come? What's he going to do? They prophesied about Jesus, but they didn't get to see him. And they believed even though they knew very little because they expected Jesus would come even though they didn't know that was his name and they didn't even really fully know what to expect. Verse 11, inquired, well, what person or time of Spirit of Christ was in them, indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Jesus and the suffering in the subsequent glories. They want to know the stories of Christ. They ask, okay, well, it sounds like he's going to suffer. What, what kind of things? What about the glory? What is that going to look like? But in 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. The prophets learned, well, I'm not really even prophesying to my, me or my people right now, I'm serving people who are going to come generations from now. That Isaiah, who stood up in the vision of heaven and said, send me, I'll go. And then God said, great, no one is going to listen to you ever now while you're alive. But he knew that thousands of years later, people would. That now we could read Isaiah 53 and we could see, wow, this is Jesus, the suffering servant described. Now, we could read Isaiah 40 and hear the grandeur and the glory of God described, and it encourages us. They did this expecting and hoping that Jesus would show up and hoping that Jesus would make it all worth it. So that those of us now who have received this good news from the Holy Spirit from heaven would come to faith. We have that phrase, too, at the end, things into which angels longed to look. Angels really wish they could have read the book that we just read this morning. Angels might have given, given anything to read portions of Scripture that we have been bored by or fallen asleep during or wanted to ah, skip to something else. 
angels would have trade places in a heartbeat to go sit back with the cubbies on Wednesday night so they could just hear a little bit about, wait, what does the gospel mean? What did Jesus do? That's incredible. Now, if that's true, um, how should that change how we live? How should that change how we act? If we have inherited such a great and a rich faith, um, shouldn't we expect Jesus to keep His promises and then live like it? Go back to verse 7. Um, you know, these things result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we should praise and glorify and honor Jesus. Jesus has been revealed to us. He was revealed when He came in the flesh. He was revealed as the resurrection, revealed as His ascension. He is revealed every single time that we open up the Bible and we read His Word. And one day, He will be fully revealed to us again. And we should expect it. We should expect to see it with our own eyes, whether we see it when we are here or that we see it when our eyes close for the last time on this side of eternity where we live in exile and open again in your true home. Expect Jesus. Where have we been this morning? Um, got four expectations. We should expect to be exiles. We should expect to be saved. We should expect to suffer. We should expect Jesus. That's what I think our expectations are as Christians. This is just a taste of what First Peter has in store for us. I hope that you expect to behold and to see Jesus through these words. And my prayer for us is that as we behold him in the book of First Peter, that we will continue to be sanctified in his likeness and grow in our expectations of seeing Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that we were born when we were born, and thank you that we are alive today. Lord, that we have all of your word in front of us. We have a nice convenient book that we can carry it around. We have it on our, our phones so we can search and read. We don't have to look through scrolls. We don't have to wait until Sunday or through the Sabbath for someone else to read a portion of it to us that we then have to memorize if we ever want to hear it again. Lord, thank you that we have gotten to hear the story and know that you came down to earth to save us and that you did and that you'll save us again. Lord, would you help us um, to adjust our expectations? to stop expecting the world and the things here to fulfill us and to meet our joys and pleasure like only you can. Help us to expect you. We pray this in the precious and the holy name of Jesus. Amen. You stand as you are able um, as we worship our Savior in song one more time. Our benediction from number six. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. Go in peace.